Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we answer the big question. Were dinosaurs warm-blooded? Plus, sceptic Rebecca Watson on how much poo can one dinosaur really contain? Welcome to Terrible Lizards. And, uh, I'm Izzy Lawrence and over on my, well, you're opposite me, but on the internet is the magnificent Dr. Dave Hone. Hello. So impressive, isn't he? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just glowing off magnificent because that's an adjective which has never been used to describe me before. Rather through me. Well, there we go. I, I, I don't know about you, dear listeners, but uh, unless it's your first time listening to this podcast, yeah, generally people quite like you, Dave. We find you quite interesting. Um, one of the most common questions you get asked, apart from what is your favourite dinosaur, do not answer that question because otherwise none of your talks are going to go well. Uh, yeah. One of the common ones, which people like me who think we're oh so clever will ask, is were dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded? Because that kind of answers the questions in our head about whether they were lizards or whether they were birds. And it, it's comforting. But why is that a stupid question, Dave? <laughs> Um, it's it's definitely a very frequent question. I don't think it's a stupid one because it it was such a mainstay of everything in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s. And then that means it still hangs on in various books and other sources. Um, but it is, I wouldn't say it's a stupid question. It's a bit but, of a stupid question because there are no warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Well, right. So, so, so the, <laughs> the, the main problem is, is that it is a flawed question because that's not really any kind of biological category that any biologist would use because it horribly smears over a massive amount of complexity, um, which then obviously feeds into this problem, um, which I will rephrase as what was the thermal physiology of dinosaurs were how were they staying or were they even staying warm um and to try and boil it down and and make sure we're talking about the right parameters um we can split up let's get rid of hot and cold blooded and talk about what things are doing so on the one hand you have animals who vary their temperature a lot uh called heterotherms or occasionally uh poikilotherms Per, per, what? Per kilotherms? What? Poi kilotherms. Poi kilotherms. Jeez. And animals which basically stay the same temperature all the time. So we uh, those are homeotherms. That makes sense, because homeo means the same and hetero means alternating. Difference. Right. So we are homeotherms. We basically stay warm all the time. and it, 37 degrees C! Yeah, and it doesn't matter if we're running around or if we're lying still and asleep or if we're in a hot climate or a cold climate climate our central core body temperature is basically the same so we are homeotherms then the heterotherms you've got things that vary their temperature quite a lot Uh, and that includes um, most obviously reptiles because they will sit out in the sun to warm up uh, and raise their body temperature and then after they've been running around a lot and they stop doing that and it gets cold at night they will shed a lot of that heat and so they were their temperature will drop again and so they are heterothermic but it's not just a pure mammal and bird and versus reptile and fish and amphibian type split there are what people might often call cold-blooded animals that have stable temperatures they can be stable and low if they live in very cold environments but they can be stable and high too so big turtles big crocodiles big fish uh, are all capable of doing this and on the other side in terms of heterotherms bears when they hibernate their body temperature plummets i forgot about hibernation yeah and you've got weird things i mean it's not even just the vertebrates i mean moths are a great example when you you've, if you've ever seen a moth sitting on a, like a windowsill and buzzing its wings it's basically just pumping its flight muscles to build up a load of heat and jack its temperature up so it can then go and do other things. Um, Now, that's a heterotherm, but it's doing a weird kind of thing that you wouldn't normally expect heterotherms to do and, you know, act doing some work to jack its muscle, uh, its heat up. So that's one axis is like hetero and homeotherms. And then the other axis, if you like, is ecto and endotherms. So ecto is outside. So those are animals drawing the heat from another source. And endo is in side and so that's animals generating oh, heat that themselves. That confuses the hell out of me because I of course did like science at school so it's endothermic and exothermic reactions so I always think exothermic means it produces heat and oh, endothermic is, it, uses it but it's the other this way around. Is, this is ecto, E-C, not oh, exo. Oh, ecto, not exo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I feel a bit better now. Yeah, so you've got, you got ecto and endotherms. 
So endotherms generate their own heat, which is what we do. But again, you can generate your own heat from other things like muscle activity um, rather than just normal physiological processes. And then ectotherms, which are getting their heat from another source, which often is or usually is the environment and in particular the sun. But again, not necessarily. It could be like those worms you get at the bottom of the um, ocean. In, ther- in thermal vents. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd argue that any parasite that's inside you, if your core body temperature basically never varies, and then any blood fluke or tapeworm is a homeotherm because they're constantly at exactly the same temperature, but they have nothing to do with it. It's just because they're sat inside you. They're cheaters. Now, yeah. I'm going to ask you a question now just because I want to know the answer to it. Because, I mean, the part of the reason we're doing this episode is because one of our patrons, Eric, wrote in and said, tell me all about all of this. And he used all the proper terms as well. So yes, and, and about but... eight questions, which we couldn't really get through. In, <laughs> no. in, but in but so, so this episode's for you, Eric. Be a patron. This is a good reason to be one. But one of the terms he used, because he used the term endothermic in his question and ectothermic in his questions, but he also used mesothermic. What's mesothermic? So a, a mesotherm is something in between. Um which doesn't quite work with the ectoendotherm, but it does work better with the homeo and heterotherms. Oh, okay. um, and so it can mean that something keeps a relatively high temperature, but not necessarily super high. Um, basically, it's another category, um, but it kind of sits within the others. And the short version is, boiling all of this down for these two axes and ecto and endo and meso and poikilothermics, is the fact that physiology is really complicated and there's lots of different ways of doing things and achieving different aims. On average, your mammals are endothermic homeotherms. They generate their own temperature and they stay warm the whole time. But you've still got things like bears hibernating. You've still got things like platypus and echidna, which actually have really really low metabolism and so were it not for a warm environment they'd actually chill quite quickly uh, a lot of we talked about naked mole rats naked mole rats have the same problem because uh, they live underground in very stable environments and actually if you take them out of their environment they don't do very well at all very quickly they haven't got they're... any fur to keep warm anyway well right and that that's part of it so although you can make these gross generalizations of yeah reptiles tend to be ectothermic heterotherms their temperature varies and they're getting the heat from outside mammals and birds the opposite there's loads and loads of uh, other variations and crossovers and weird things going on and then you've got stuff like hummingbirds which basically hibernate effectively overnight so they just plummet their body temperature and shut their physiology down and then just warm up again the next day um yeah so, some very small mammals like uh, dormice and, and uh, harvest mice can do something similar so there is no big block of physiology which describes huge chunks of the fa- of the of the vertebrate um, family tree, as it were. There's lots of exceptions. There's lots of weird things going on, and it can vary with all kinds of things like environment and climate and body size and types of insulation. So body size, we know that dinosaurs are big. I'm jumping on this. If dinosaurs well, apart are big, from all the small ones, and remember that even very big things had small babies. Oh. So. Uh, Right. So this is the whole thing. It's so asking the question, even changing the question to what was the thermal physiology of dinosaurs? There's not going, even if we boiled all our research down and I was able to give you a very simple one word answer, which obviously I'm not going to because we haven't. um, The problem is you wouldn't really expect there to be a single answer because you wouldn't expect a 50, 60 ton sauropod that lived in a warm environment to have the same kind of physiology as a five kilo dromaeosaur living in the Arctic where it turned into a foot of snow every winter. It's really unlikely. They're doing different things in different ways at different now. times. Right. Um, so, you know, you've got all these factors in. And so there is not one simple catch-all answer. And we shouldn't expect one. Um, and even if, say, you know, we did a dozen studies or 500 studies on 500 species and found they all kind of did the same thing, that's probably still not going to cover the answer because there will be some weird ones somewhere and we just haven't found them yet. But the really, really short version, as short as we can make it, is that dinosaurs are at some level homeotherms and probably to a certain degree endothermic homeotherms. They are probably generating their own heat and they are staying warm, which is what birds do. That's what we do. It is also what we do. So, but dinosaurs warm-blooded. There's your answer, everybody. Everybody <laughs> go home now. <laughs> the, the, the end. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oddly enough, there's been tons of arguments about this. I mean, it goes right back to the absolute first days of research when they pulled out these absolutely colossal animals that they were sure were reptiles and went, oh, well, they're probably reptilian and then reconsidered really quite quickly and went, but they seem to have an upright stance, which reptiles don't have. And they're really, really big. And it's quite probable, actually, that they were a bit more active than that. Uh, and so maybe they were doing something a bit different, even if they were just very active reptiles and because presumably if you're that large and you have to get all your energy from the sun it's going to take ages to heat up well once you heat up you tend to stay warm so we we've talked about this in uh, in the in the first series we talked about giganto homeothermy and again this is what lots of things you know big crocs do basically they're so big that they have a lot of volume and not so much surface area. So any heat they do have, they're pretty good at keeping it in. And because, you know, the sun comes back around the next day, and particularly with things like crocs, they can sit in water. Water's very good at maintaining heat as well. Um, they're pretty good at, the biggest animals are pretty good at keeping their temperature fairly constant, despite the fact that they're reliant on the environment for their heat. Um, so, yeah, this, so this has been a, a long-standing problem. Um, lots of debate. It's gone backwards and forwards. Um, and obviously, it's tended to go, were they reptiles or were they birds? Already ignoring the fact that reptiles do different things, birds do different things, mammals do different things, there's probably not one answer. What is true of a giant sauropod is probably not true of a tiny theropod, etc. Um, but there's a whole bunch of lines of evidence which at least at the bare minimum point to high levels of activity. Feet. They have feet. They move. Feet, feet, also, feet <laughs> also point. Feet also points to the moving. Yes, good. Two points. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> write, that, write that down for later. But yeah, so so they grow fast. When we when we look at the growth rings in their bones, I think we've talked about those before. I think so because we talked about. I remember cod's ears. Yes, otoliths. Yeah, same thing. Right. You can count the rings, see how fast they grow. They grow really fast. Now, it's hard to grow really fast without a high metabolism. You can cheat that if you live somewhere equatorial and there's tons and tons of sun, but mostly you're probably going to be doing that because you fundamentally have a high metabolism and you're active and lots of things are going on in your body which allows you to grow fast. I just want to, I just want to, mainly because people, uh, because metabolism is a very colloquial word and people associate that primarily with just getting fat. So (laughs) if you don't have a high metabolism, you get fat. And having a high metabolism is basically the amount of energy a body uses. Is that right? Yeah. And in in this context generates particularly for heat. Mm. Um, And yeah, some animals are relatively high metabolism. And so they need lots of food because they're doing stuff all the time. Like that and birds and some things are low metabolism because yeah if you're a lizard and you're getting most of your heat from the sun and you're not generating it internally that much 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 less effort um and therefore they eat roughly about a fifth of what we do in terms of calories per unit mass of animal it's like when you feed your fish you don't you can easily overfeed them and they don't eat much they eat a tiny amount compared to a mouse the same size as a goldfish yeah also the usual thing that you're giving fish of course is just like pure protein and fat and so there's a lot of energy in it whereas you're giving your mouse lots of seeds and stuff which is carrots less right so there's less energy but yes fundamentally that's part of it as well is that yeah lizards aren't doing you know a few insects will keep them going for a week a mouse of the same size needs a lot more energy going in so dinosaurs grow quick um we also see from their bones they have certain uh properties uh with blood vessel holes in their bones which is linked to rapid growth so they're growing quickly that's a pretty good indication that they're doing something thermally active. That's true of dinosaurs that lived in all kinds of different environments in all kinds of different places, including those that lived in very cold environments um, and that were very cold in winter, like modern winters in Northern Europe, in Central Canada and these these sorts of places. Um, Again, that's very hard to do as a reptile. They usually shut down and hibernate. They do not stay active and stay warm and keep growing and a lot of them just don't like living there at all yeah I mean, you we really don't see many large reptiles up in scotland or up in yeah, in you, canada you, or yeah. 
Yeah, reptiles don't do as well in cold environments. It's really quite simple. I mean, I, I, I hate to distract again, but just because I'm interested. But I, and were there places which did have permafrost, and that there were dinosaur in? in this I time? don't. I don't know about permafrost. I mean, we we have decent evidence of dinosaurs being in cold environments when those environments were cold. So obviously, okay. you know, if you if you go to say Alberta, it's boiling hot in summer. It's freezing cold and there's feet of snow on the ground in winter. We have evidence suggesting that dinosaurs were there ye- in environments like that year round. So it's not just that they migrated out when it got cold and then came back again. They okay. were staying there. And were they but were they hibernating like bears do? Do we know? I don't think we have any good evidence for that at all. Um, I'm not sure you'd be able to pull evidence like that out from their system. All we need to do is find their sleeping bags. Yeah, and the, and the do not disturb sign they had to hang on the rock at the end of the cave. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I, as, as per every cartoon I've ever seen. See, it's uh, easy. Uh... <laughs> this is paleontology stuff, it's easy. But yeah, so they were living in these cold environments, which meant they had to be able to generate their own heat. Not necessarily had to, okay. but it's very leading. Mm. Um, so, you know, the rec- just fairly recently, there was some nice stuff doing around. So crocodiles and alligators are supposed to be really quite limited and do very poorly in cold. Um, and there were some nice photos doing the rounds of alligators basically hibernating in ponds with their nose stuck above the ice, um, which I think a lot of people didn't think they could do. I certainly didn't. Um, and suggest that they can do a bit better in colder environments than we thought they could and that they're, ex- you know, they might be able to extend a bit further north than normal. That would be terrifying. If you if you go out, because, you know, you're meant to melt your ice um, in the yeah. morning with hot water. And imagine doing that. There's a crocodile mm. in your pond. Be careful before you pour. Happily, you'd see the nose sticking out. So as long That's as you true. keep an eye out. It's... But they're made to look like logs. They're, they're quite good at that. Um, but yeah, the, these are all reasons to think that they were potentially... You know, relatively hot. So let's let's try and keep it okay. that way. The the fact that they were insulated, you know, the fact that we see feathers in lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs suggests that they were relatively warm. Things usually only have insulating things like feathers or like fur, or in the case of moths, with their you know fuzziness, is to try and keep heat in. Now, moths are obviously a counterexample because they are ectothermic heterotherms, but they're specifically trying to insulate and keep heat in as much as possible. This is a common feature with things that if you spent a lot of metabolic energy to generate heat, you want to keep it and not just throw it away. I know they're not dinosaurs, but moths. Is that is the reason moths are like that more than, say, butterflies, simply because they're out at night? I assume colder. so, yeah. I, yeah. I do not know enough about moth okay. thermophysiology, but yes, Sorry. nights are generally colder than, than day. And certainly I can think of a few diurnal moths that aren't particularly fuzzy. Um, mm. So yeah, I imagine that's a fair old part of it. But yeah, these these are all reasons to think that dinosaurs are fundamentally at some level warm and maintaining that heat. Uh, and it's interesting that you see things like, you know, the, the growth trajectory of, you know, big hadrosaurs, big sauropods, going from very tiny animals to very, very big animals, um, and still maintaining, uh, you know, apparently high activity levels and high growth rates. Well, this is what confuses me a bit, because we all know about surface area. So like, you know, mice have got a very, oh, I've got to work this out now. They've got a very high surface area, so they don't over overheat and elephants yeah. have got a very small surface area so they don't freeze but if yeah. you're going to start out and all your babies are going to be we and then you're going to grow up in something much bigger than an elephant the surface area ratios were they very i don't know flappy skinned as babies well it's more were they pro- when you're talking about the big sauropods were they flappy skinned as adults so oh, gosh, you know big, big savannah african big savannah african elephants are more worried about getting rid of heat than keeping it in so they've got rid of their hair they've got really big ears they do lots of things like sitting in shade and bathing in water and bathing in mud and having dust baths um that's probably a bigger issue for a 30 or 40 ton sauropod uh it's more about losing heat than the baby's keeping the heat in um their proportions in the grand scheme of things for the sauropods at least really don't change very much i think that's generally true of the others as well but yeah that's just the bones we don't know did you know did adult sauropods have great big pouches in their throat or great big folds of skin on their necks and their tails for example did they just shift behavior massively were they fundamentally nocturnal you know they just dozed during the day and did as little as possible and then came out when it was much cooler at night wouldn't their eyes tell us something about that um potentially um they do have decent sized eyes but then you eyes. said you said 
um, Brontosaurus in our episode about Brontosaurus, it had really good sparkly eyes. I remember. I don't remember using the word sparkly. <laughs> it was dip- it's Diplodocus. Sorry, Diplodocus. Sorry. I've- Lots of these things have fairly big eyes. And also, so, you know, there's all these different trade-offs. You know, we don't know quite what they're doing. If, if an animal fundamentally was nocturnal and it shifted to black and white vision, which is what most prime, uh, sort of what a lot of mammals have done, um, then obviously you actually get better vision for a proportionally smaller eye. If you're a really big sauropod and basically carnivores don't bother you, then you probably don't need great eyesight at night because you're ne- almost never attacked, so you don't need to worry very much. But we don't really know, and so these possible alternatives and these possible trade-offs are all just kind of left hanging. Um, and so, yeah, even if we could work out with real accuracy what the thermal physiology of an adult diplodocus is, and spoiler, we can't. Um, and even if we, you know, even if we could say, oh, it's it's super like this, it's like okay, but there's still a range of temperatures. Goats are about two degrees Celsius warmer than humans. That makes quite a big difference. If you had animals which were, you know, you can be a endothermic homeotherm, but maybe that temperature is only about thirty degrees Celsius, much lower than our thirty-seven. In which case, that's much less energy you need to burn all the time. Um, so all these different things are, are, are possibilities. Um, and we don't know enough. And then you start getting into behavioral adaptations or soft tissue structures. You know, maybe they had tons of blood vessels close to the skin surface and they could blush really red, but then use that to leach loads of heat at the first opportunity. Embarrassed sauropods. Um, possibly. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it, you know, but all the, all these things are out there and they're the kind of things which are a possibility, but it is very, very hard to say anything meaningful about them when there's no underlying bone or you can't calculate the environmental temperature with huge accuracy and you can't calculate the body temperature of the animal with huge accuracy and you don't know quite how much it varies. Basically, pretty much all dinosaurs were some kind of of warm nearly all of the time and our best guess for most of that our best guess is that's probably a bit ungenerous there is good reason to think that they are endothermic homeotherms again it leaves so many possibilities for what various lineages are doing given the size surface area environment and not and on a day-to-day basis and on a seasonal basis and whether there was shade or abundant water or this that and the other and bleh, it gets complicated really really fast and leaves us open with an annoying number of possibilities what what i'm going to ask now is kind of a i basically want the two models so say you've got your sauropod so either it's going to be incredibly active but maybe i mean but this is the thing how much food does it is it going to need to keep itself warm and to keep that sort of because we talked about this in the diplodocus episode yeah we we we, we did and i and i talked about gigantic so homeothermy in there, which which I I think answers quite a lot of problems for sauropods if they're not particularly um, endothermic in that they're not particularly generating a huge amount of heat. Um, I've been pulled up on that by some of my colleagues who've suggested that I've I've gone too far and that there is better evidence suggesting they are true endotherms. Though again, that still leaves us well, maybe their endothermic peak temperature is a bit low, in which case these yada 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 and all these behavioural adaptations which might act as as trade offs for it. Um, but it's still certainly true that when you are big. Um, you will tend to shed heat slowly and you will be pretty good at keeping heat in. Um, so that already is going to change the dynamics. You know, alvarosaurs, which we've talked about, you know, 30 centimetres long, baby alvarosaurs, a fraction of that size, you know, they're going to be kind of like sparrow-sized animals. It would be unlikely if they had a truly a similar physiology to... <laughs> Diplodocus, let alone getting onto something like Argentinosaurus, etc. Uh, you know, again, there's going to be different things going on. But the, the big efficiency thing, though, is more just about sheer size. When you're really big, it's going, to, you know, there's more of you. It's, it sounds stupid, but it's, it's obvious, you know, and things don't just scale up normally. You know, large animals have disproportionately large bones. 
because you know it's that scaling effect when you're twice as long you're also twice as wide and you're twice as tall which means your volume is eight times bigger um which means you're eight times heavier we, we often say oh it's twice as big well it might be if you measured it nose to tail but if one's 10 meters long and the other one's 20 meters long the 20 meter long one weighs eight times more that's a vast amount more and so it's going to need much much thicker bones to support its weight it's going to need bigger muscles to then move those thicker and heavier bones and that heavier animal proportionally larger ones but um, it's not going to need eight times the amount of food but it's not going to need eight times the amount of food um so partly because it's probably going to be good at keeping its heat in so maybe you don't need to generate as much heat um but the other thing is it's going to have a much 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 longer digestive system and if you're a herbivore and of course pretty much all the giant things you know t-rex the biggest carnivores top out at around six to eight tons depending on quite which estimate you believe they probably got bigger than that but those are about as big as we get the biggest herbivores much much you know at least 50 tons almost certainly 70 plus um so we're talking about really 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 big herbivores though this effect is going to be true of even much smaller herbivores anything over about five tons certainly over anything over about 10 tons as a herbivore is going to start benefiting from this kind of stuff cellulose lignin the stuff that makes up a lot of leaves and the stuff that makes up a lot of bark and tree is really really tough stuff it's very very hard to digest indeed and there's a couple of ways you can try and do better at doing that one of them is just to keep digesting it over and over and over chew the cud famously yeah cows have four chambered stomachs chewing the cud they regurgitate rechew swallow redigest rabbits eat their own poo sort of they have rabbits have two types of poo um so they have a basically they do they have a quick process for grassy stuff which then comes out and they eat again so it runs through the digestive system a second time and then they have their true waste after the second time um but yeah they're, they're all trying to do the same thing which is keep stuff in their body longer so that the bacteria that are inside them have longer to break down stuff like lignin and cellulose now a very easy way of keeping stuff in your body longer is just be absolutely massive you automatically have a much 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 longer digestive system with a much bigger stomach and you can keep loads of food in there all the time now the average animal does not get much back from plants there's a reason that they eat lots uh, compared to say a carnivore you know like your average carnivore needs a lot less food a lot less volume of food than your average herbivore if you go to the zoo and you'll see a line of big animals got a chunk of meat and it'll they'll give that every two or three days if it's a crocodile every week there's much less um thermal physiology again whereas herbivores are just basically eating constantly you know they're just going through stuff all the time there is much less nutrition in it and that's because they will struggle to digest it and get it out however if you can just leave that stuff in your digestive tract for a ages and ages and ages and ages and ages it will eventually break down and so per unit of food that you have eaten a really big herbivore will get much more energy out of it than a really small herbivore will or even a much medium-sized herbivore so a five-ton dinosaur say eating you know let's call it you know x amount of greens will get y amount of energy a 10-ton herbivore could eat the same x volume and get not necessarily double but y times quite a high multiplier to get it well above which means that yeah just because you're twice as big and here i mean mass rather than any kind of linear measurement just because you're twice as big doesn't mean you need twice as much food you need dramatically less than twice as much and that efficiency will climb as you get bigger and there's been some studies by a group based in germany uh, and austria suggesting that actually some of the plants that were in the mesozoic that we know dinosaurs were eating because we've got them as stomach contents or as coprolites and things like this have massively higher energy returns than a lot of modern plants do if you can break them down and certainly when you're talking about a 20 or a 30 ton sauropod and certainly when you're talking about bigger ones they probably can and so yeah suddenly some of these problems of saying well elephants are just eating all the time and they can barely stay alive 
exaggeration, but that's the argument. How on earth could you possibly get a sauropod with a little mouth possibly consume enough vegetation to keep itself going? And the answer is because it's probably eating um, more energetically containing food than something like an elephant. And then it's getting much more energy back than an elephant might. And if its thermal physiology is a bit lower, it doesn't need as much anyway per kilo of animal. And so suddenly it looks like actually you can have an awful lot more mass of sauropod, even with a relatively high physiology and metabolism, than you can of mammal for the same amount of food. And then dinosaur ecosystems don't look anything like as weird. Yeah. So why don't we get these big fauna anymore then that are able to do this? I mean, we get whales, I suppose. Well, they're obviously eating animals because, mm. you know, we talk about them eating plankton because most they mostly eat a krill, which are tiny little shrimps. Um, so, of course, there's, you know, a lot more energy coming out of them. Um, the, well, part of it is because the modern world is really weird. And I don't just mean the last 2,000 years. I mean, like, you know, the last few hundred thousand years. There are probably fewer small, large animals now than there have been at any point in the last couple of hundred million. Because basically we killed them all off. Um, <laughs> that that combined with ice ages and other things. But, you know, we talk about elephants. You know, we've got now most people recognize two species of elephant in Africa. So the forest elephant in the rainforests in the Congo, and the savannah elephant in Maso Mara Serengeti down to South Africa, and the Asian elephant, though the, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that wasn't more than one species from, you know, India through to Malaya kind of thing. Um, and the savannah elephant is, or the a savannah elephant and the forest elephant are pretty much the same size but you know record-breaking specimens of that are six seven tons kind of size um and that's three all right even if you allow for there's a couple more undiagnosed you know a handful of species you don't need to go back very far into prehistory and there were a dozen or a couple of dozen elephant species many of which would have been bigger than the largest elephants now as normal and more rhino species and more hippos and then giant things like calicotheres uh, and indricotheres and uh, giant relatives Terabus. of giraffes well, and stuff like that too, but it's like, um, you know, many more very big species. We live in what's got, you know, we live in a, we have a depauperate fauna globally. We have not many species than we should have, and we have far fewer big things in particular. So you've got to remember that using the modern world as an analogue for what a, in commas, normal ecosystem might have looked like for the last 200 million years is a bad idea because in some ways this is the weird ecosystem setup. This is the really different one that's not like normal ecosystems. Oh We've idea. disturbed and worse. perturbed everything and removed loads of numbers of species and then we've got nothing. invasives everywhere. But our ecosystems are big really stuff. Weird. And, um, and we've come to have loads and loads and loads of big you know, going to the and plus and seeing species. Species. how elephants and rhinos and lions and giraffe interact. We're going to get questions about it anyway so we're going to ask before we get loads of emails. But the idea that humans and humanoids and are the ones that killed off the big species. Is that really likely? In various ways, yes. Um, so there's lots of different things. So we we hunt big species. That obviously causes Mammoths. problems. Yes, but we also disturb environments. You know, we plant our crops, we dig things up. We've only been planting crops for 10,000 years, though. That's true. But, but, but ritualistic burning of forests to drive animals out and open up growth and things is very normal. If ancient hominid groups were doing something like that, i.e. burning lots of stuff far more often than the environment is used to, that is going to do a lot of damage to a lot of species. And we have these things called trophic cascades or ecological cascades, where the effect on one species knocks on to affect another species and another species and another species and suddenly you get really dramatic changes without having had to do very much um you know you can imagine okay i've introduced this fly that came over with me when i brought it brought it over and it's just a tiny fly and it can't do anything well it turns out that tiny fly really quite like eating a certain kind of caterpillar and that caterpillar has never encountered that fly before it has no evolutionary defense to it 
and it does very, very poorly. Well, it turns out that that caterpillar turns into a butterfly, which is the only pollinator of the biggest tree in the environment, which produces loads and loads and loads of fruit that all the big animals rely on when there's a drought every year. And yeah. suddenly that one fly has killed the caterpillar, which has killed the tree, which has killed the fruit, which means that all the big animals don't have any drought surviving things anymore. And suddenly your ecosystem completely changes overnight. And so these kinds of things are, in some level, remarkably uncommon. On the other hand, if you keep messing around with environments, then you're effectively buying more tickets on the bad lottery and you're more likely to hit something that will have major effects like that. But you also have huge, you know, events like, you know, uh, volcano eruptions that, you know, cause yeah, loads I mean, of things yeah, going out as well. Right. And things like ice ages are going to have that influence. But, you know, we have things like, you know, the moa in New Zealand. You know, we have evidence of them having been attacked by humans and butchered by humans. We have evidence of them cooking eggshells. There's eggshells found in like a fire pit with heat damage to them and stuff like this. Um, humans obviously inevitably usually bring rats, dogs, pigs and other things with them which will eat eggs and attack babies and just cause stress for animals and yada 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 I mean at the bare minimum even if you look at the last three four hundred years our track record of going to environments and obliterating everything is pretty rotten uh <laughs> Yes, but we we make lovely swimming pools, so, you know. (laughs) We do, and burning coal is just so lovely. Um, But, yeah, yeah, yes, it's obvious, again, as usual, it's more complicated than that. But anthropogenic-driven extinctions of many large species in many large, in, in many environments is definitely a thing. If you want to nitpick about exactly what we may or may not have killed off or exactly what other contributing factors uh, with climate change and other invasives and yada yada, people are welcome to. But fundamentally, a major part of what has driven lots of big things to extinction is stuff we've done. And I don't think that's really very controversial. No, no, it's not at all. I just think it's I think it's interesting because I think there, there is a, such a both an awakening as to climate science, but also a denial of it at the same time time trying to counter it it's interesting to see how in the past how different the environment was before man was here and the impact that and it's not just man it's it's you know it's neanderthals as well it's you know it's yeah, all it's not of just us. homo sapiens yes exactly it's it's it's, ev- it's everybody that but we killed them off too so uh, yeah. <laughs> well right but i mean you know we want to do extinction in another episode but you know i mm. teach about mass extinctions to my to my undergraduates And, you know, there are different causes. There's famously with the dinosaurs, primarily a big meteor or asteroid, I should say, came down and hit the Earth. We've got mass volcanism, mass methane release, actually the evolution of land plants, stuff like this. But ultimately what really is doing it is the climate changed very rapidly. Lots of things didn't adapt to that. Lots of things went extinct. Ecosystem cascades and suddenly you've got a wasteland. That is kind of in a nutshell what climate change really is. And, oh, look what we've got going on at the moment. Oh, but it's natural. It's natural. No, it's, it's always happened. <laughs> it, it I'm has, being sarcastic. I know, I know. <laughs> it has always But I, I tell my students this because I'm, I'm trying to, um, you know, inoculate them to a certain degree. Extinction is natural. Climate change is natural. It being driven by one species knowing full well what it's doing and generating this amount of change this quickly and this amount of extinction this quickly is not natural. And talking of steaming piles of excrements, which is what climate change is, um, fortunately we have another guest on the podcast and that is um, the sceptic, science wizards and wonderful human, which is Rebecca Watson. So so who knew that dino poo could be so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, uh, Rebecca, right, are you, because you are obviously a science nerd, you're a science geek, you absolutely adore everything about it. Were you ever a fan of dinosaurs growing up? No, I hated them. Really? Yeah. That's what no, not no. <laughs> no, come on. Every, every kid was a fan of dinosaurs. Like, I feel like if you have a kid and that kid doesn't like dinosaurs, you should just send it back. <laughs> like, just get... Get a refund on that kid. <laughs> yeah, I had, um, I like, I had dinosaur play toys that, like, I can still vividly picture. They were like the thin plastic, rubbery plastic, and they came in like neon greens and reds. And I used to play, like, I had uh, really com- complex storylines for each of them. <laughs> 
Um, I had a I had a Tyrannosaurus Rex pencil topper that nice. I was a huge fan of, and I I really wanted I I thought at one point that I might be a great artist, and I still distinctly remember this that like oh I, I'll draw a T Rex and I'll use my pencil topper as like a um, an outline. So I drew an outline of it and I wrote like terrible thunder lizard next to it. Oh. And it looked, it looked like, it did not look like a T-Rex. It looked like a, like a squirrel. Presumably it was also not very big if this was a pencil topper. No. So yeah, it was, it was, it was maybe an inch and a half. <laughs> Prone to exaggeration. Um, but yeah, I, <clears throat> I love dinosaurs. And when I was in like seventh grade, so this would have been, and seventh grade would be like I was twelve when I was about twelve. I read um, Jurassic Park, <gasps> and because my dad had all of Michael Crichton's books, and so I read that one, and I loved it. And then, like <clears throat> I think, like a year later, maybe uh, the movie came out, and I've seen that movie so many times. My boyfriend and I just rewatched it last year. It holds up, like yeah. So yeah. I like I like dinosaurs. <laughs> so you have start. a question then that you've always wanted to know the answer to, or or one that you've fabricated very quickly for the podcast. <laughs> I I I have one, and it's actually yes, I do. I have a question, and it is in fact related to Jurassic Park. In a, a fairly famous scene, um, Jeff Goldblum and um, El- Ellie. Uh, Forget Sattler the yeah, is the character Sattler. you're thinking of Laura Dern. Laura Dern, thank you. Um, uh, they they see a giant pile of poo. And so they pull over. And here's the thing. Uh, this giant pile of poo is uh, as tall as Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. And it came from a Triceratops that's sick. And like I've been sick before to the point where I pooed a lot, but I looked up, um, I looked up some some figures here, and Jeff Goldblum is six foot four, and uh, the average Triceratops, according to Google, was just under ten feet tall. Sorry that I'm using American no, that's, freedom that's units fine. here, yes. but. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> So I've been sick before, but I have never in my life pooed out two thirds of my own height. <laughs> yeah. So my question is, how much did the average dinosaur poop? Was it possible for them to poop their own body weight? Or did they like, was that multiple poops that they, did they collect their poop in one spot? Tell me about dinosaur poop. So, so there are, so I saw that film at age 15 or 16, I think it was when it came out. And although I was not a hyper dinosaur nerd at that age, I remember that scene very clearly. And I remember at that age going, that's way too high for a dinosaur that big. <laughs> because that's the thing, that's not a very big triceratops in that scene. It's right. the pile is literally higher than the hips of that dinosaur. Like they clearly, yeah. I mean. And I'm like, did the did the di- did did the dinosaur uh, poop in one spot repeatedly, and then when the pile got too big, like climbed on top, top of, of the it, pile? Right, to but poop. it looks like a fresh pile. There's no tracks or anything. Yeah, I right. Know. It's pyramid shaped. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. It it really looks like the idea is the animal got there and went ah, <sighs> and that's what came out. Only like yeah, how how? So yeah, yeah I, I'm with you a thousand percent. No, that's unbelievably false. Um, Secondly, it's okay, the animal is supposed to be sick, but it's completely amorphous and very few animals produce anything like that. You know, we, we've had in the first series, we talked about wombats and their cube shape pooped, but you know, horses, elephant, giraffe, dogs, sharks, turtles, most things produced some form of distinct shape. Not, right, like a turd of some sort, right, not, not just some a pile of enormous compost. Enormous indeterminate mass. I mean, the only thing you could probably say is cows with cow pats, but even there, that's often when they're on super rich grass that's very, very wet, and they will normally leave something that's more constrained. So yeah, I, I think it's extremely unlikely that dinosaurs just produced a mass, sick or otherwise. <laughs> Um, and then how much uh, is quite a, a tricky question. So it comes down to basically what, qu- quite how 
tough the plants are in particular because carnivores will always just be eating meat and produce something pretty pretty small and hard like just just how tough the plants are that they're eating and then just how much they can break them down um we do have evidence of at least a couple of the big duck bill dinosaurs eating wood so there's some coprolite material known from them with loads of wood in it and i mean straight up tree wood presumably we think something that was decaying you know it was a rotten tree trunk or something like that so they're not just hold on so did duck bill dinosaurs have sharp teeth They've got um, very, well, it, it, they, they've got these weird, so they have these leaf-shaped teeth. It really looks like a giant leaf um, with a ridge down the side, each side, and a ridge up the middle. Um, and then, but they wear against each other, and so they, the, they, they'd be worn down really quite quickly. But it's a, it's a fairly narrow contact surface. Um, but they're really good <laughs> at kind of cutting and crushing, cutting through stuff and, and grinding it up a little bit. Hmm. um with the 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 wear facet we'd call it where the where the two two pieces meet and that would be quite sharp in the sense that yeah it's not a particularly rough point i've actually got some garden shears on the table because i was doing my plants earlier and just brought them in of course you do yeah but something like that you know it it, you know garden shears you know you wouldn't want to put your finger in them but if you actually look at them it's not like they're super sharp blades it's actually fairly blunt on one side and even the blade cutting bit is not like some kind of amazing razor. It's because you've got leverage and power going into it that you're doing real damage. Um, so yeah, so in some cases, we know they're eating wood. We think it was probably something quite old and dead. It's not like they just went up to a tree and took some nice chunks out midway through the trunk. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you're eating lots of wood, if you're eating really fibrous stuff like plant stems and bark, you can expect what comes out the other end to be really pretty tough and, and solid, and therefore be really quite a lot of it. On the other hand, when you get onto the really big dinosaurs, and I'm talking about the, you know, the absolute biggest sauropods, we're talking animals, 50 tons plus, um, you know, absolute monsters, even stuff like wood is just sitting in the digestive tract for so long, it's probably really going to be broken down very heavily. And so what comes out at the end is probably going to be very fibrous, but it might end up looking like horse manure, which is fairly tough and fibrous, but from something much tougher at the start to right. still end up producing something like that. But as with elephants, Izzy, if I told the elephant story, this is the problem when you record multiple things at random times. Don't think you've told the, the elephant story. You can tell don't, the don't, story. Don't, don't eat apples offered to you by an elephant keeper at a zoo. Okay. <laughs> I I don't need any other context. I just won't do that. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> elephants have a kind of quick and dirty digestive process and surprisingly um soft things can pass through unmolested. And when wow. I worked at London Zoo, I was warned if you go to the elephant house and they offer you a piece of fruit, don't take it because every so often a piece of fruit travels through and obviously that is offered to the first person who comes in and doesn't know that elephants are capable of doing that. But maybe it's like the civet where, uh, you know, civet coffee. Yeah. Yeah. The the elephant has chosen coffee bean, not an an apple. The elephant has chosen the best apple possible. possible. Yes, and it's going to knock your socks off. The the, 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 fl- the flip side of that story is it totally ruins the marketing campaign. So if you've if you've ever have you seen Tilly hats? So these are I don't know what that th- is. It's, it's 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 just a hat you buy for the field if you're really into your field work and and being rugged and stuff. They're these really nice soft cloth hats that you get. They're really expensive. They advertise how amazingly tough and resilient they are, and the little label has a story about you know these are the best handmade da 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 and lifetime guarantee. And then tell the story that once an elephant ate one, and when the keeper got it the other end, he just gave it a wash and put it back on his head because that's how good their hats are. And when I read that and go. Yeah, but if an apple can make it through, I'd be pretty surprised if a hat didn't. Uh, yeah, way to debunk that marketing. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was skeptical, strangely enough, about them about their claims. Um, so, yeah, lo- long story short, I think for the big animals, even eating tough stuff, you can expect something quite a lot of breakdown. And yes, yeah, you say I would expect a turd, not a splat. Uh, for for any for anything though, though we do have so that there is a there is a tyrannosaurus coprolite uh so that is fossil poo and it is a splat um that that animal <laughs> mostly i mean it's it's kind of got shape but it's fairly amorphous and it it looks like 
it was a bit runny, let's be blunt. So, but is it is it because tyrannosaurs were more like birdy in their sort of you know poo, or are they more um, cat like? Or I, I think the idea in this case is this, it probably just wasn't very well, or at least oh, whatever. <laughs> it wasn't a particularly normal experience. So yeah, there's this idea that reptiles kind of produce this this swash of liquid, which they sort of do, but actually, you know, I've kept snakes and and I've kept geckos and, and, and other lizards. And yeah, they still produce a fairly solid lump. Um, so, and, and that wouldn't just wash away with any liquid that was coming with it and, and spread it out, which suggests that the original was pretty squishy. With a T-Rex, though, you're also having the poo drop from potentially, a great height. For, potentially, yeah. I mean, you know, three meters-ish could quite easily... That'll splat most things. Well, right. Yeah, if it's already softer. If it's um, soft. Though, yeah. though I don't know, carnivore... watermelon on a rock. Though, you know, generally, you know, carnivores, it's pretty hard um, if they're eating, you know, meat and bone. Um, so... Yeah, um, dinosaur poo. We don't have very much. It's kind of annoying. We have a few. So in in some in some situations, those kind of things are really common. Um, but of course, the problem is these animals. This is soft stuff, and it's the kind of stuff which will wash away if it gets swirled around in water in a way that, of course, bones won't. And of course, lots of animals eat it. Um, you know, it's lots of flies and beetles and rodents, yeah, and dogs uh, and yeah. other things, you know. But you know, but that, that that will break down quite quickly in most situations. So, on that in that circumstance, it's actually perhaps not real surprise that we we have very few. Um, yeah. that they're soft; they will break down fast. That is a bad combination for being preserved. If they did poop in like enormous piles that were the size of their body we'd probably have more evidence. Uh, we'd have more coprolite, right? Because, like, that wouldn't break down. That wouldn't break down so much. That's, that's very true, actually. So, yeah, that, that would probably stop that. And similarly, so you get animals that are called latrine animals that like going in one place. So rabbit, if, if you've got a rabbit, a pet rabbit, you know, they like having their corner or their spot. And there are animals that will do this very consistently. Sloths, when they come down from the trees for their weekly business, they will go back to the same spot. So, of course, those can build up and build up and build up. Um, right. It'd be fun if there was a whole herd of dinosaurs, a whole herd of 20-ton, 30-ton sauropods <laughs> that every week go back to the spot. Uh, you can imagine that that would be a quite interesting discovery. Imagine the, the line. But the, 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 would we ever recognize it is, is the problem with that. I think there's some gi- I think there's some giant sloth stuff like that actually. Oh. Um, yeah, that would make sense. I think there are gi- I think there are giant sloth caves where there's this mass <laughs> uh because they they would go back to the same spot and a giant sloth is quite a big animal. <laughs> Wow, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking. Maybe I'm, I'm looking around at the hills around me now, thinking maybe that could be one, one of, of those, these hills. Yeah, yeah we not- think it's a hill. <laughs> <laughs> Do things grow really well on one particular? Hill? Is it very rich in nitrogen? <laughs> mm, slightly stinky. Well, Rebecca, yeah. does that answer your question? Are you happy? It. it- it really did. This has been wonderfully educational, and I thank you both. <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much for coming on. Um, thank you very much to Rebecca Watson. Um, obviously, if you have a question or you want to argue with us about man's destruction on the environment, uh, please feel free. Do um, uh, use the hashtag. <laughs> we we won't stuff. respond, but you're welcome. To no, no, no. <laughs> I, I think, I think, I think we would a little bit. Um, but no, it, it is, it is a fascinating thing to investigate. And like I said, we're going to do a, an episode on dinosaurs or extinction coming up later in this series. You can also check out our Patreon for a few extra episodes and um, buy some buy a lovely mug to sip your coal-powered, warm water based beverage in and feel guilty about the destruction of the planet. But hey, hey, that's enough for now. We'll see you next week. Rawr. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. For bonus episodes and extra content, please visit our Patreon page. You can also also purchase a mug, t-shirt or a terrible lizard face mask from Redbubble. Go to terriblelizards.co.uk for links. Send us your questions. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook and Twitter. Include the hashtag terriblelizards. We hope to bring you more and more, but we can only do that if we get enough listeners. So please like, share, leave a review and subscribe. 